Next, from Springfield, we talked to Greg Bays, president and CEO of the Illinois Manufacturers Association, and Dennis Bringuet, the owner of Ace Sign Company in Springfield, about the loss of manufacturing jobs in Illinois, as well as the lack of workers to fill those jobs. This runs about 25 minutes. Greg Bays and uh, Dennis Bringuet, thank you for joining us on the Illinois Channel. We wanted to talk, one of the main issues that we often hear being discussed is this whole uh, discussion about workers' compensation and what we need to do uh, to change the business climate in Illinois. The governors often raise these issues, and we thought it would be very instructive for our viewers to be able to hear from both you, Greg, as the head of the manufacturers, and from someone who is a manufacturer. So we thanks for joining us. Greg, let me start with you. Just from the big picture standpoint, how is Illinois to do business in? What are you hearing from your members around the state as far as what they need changed and, and why do we hear so much about workers' comp? Well, we are talking about, and on sort of a statewide tour right now, uh, reminding people and pointing out that Illinois has lost over 300,000 manufacturing jobs since uh, the turn of the century. And really since the end of the 08-09 recession, many of our Midwestern neighbors have been doing better than us in bringing those jobs back. In fact, Michigan, 171,000 net jobs. Uh, Indiana, 83,000 net jobs. Uh, Illinois in that same time period is essentially flat and not in increasing the number of manufacturing jobs at all. Now, is there a great difference between Michigan, Ohio, even our neighboring states, Kentucky or Iowa? I don't think so. I think that we have to be looking inward. There's a systemic problem here. And one of the reasons that we hear most often of why jobs are not coming to this state is workers' compensation. It's cost to business owners. Um, manufacturers have an ability to possibly move to places that are uh, uh, less expensive. A company like Ace Sign, it's been a long-term uh, business here in Springfield, doesn't have that luxury to just up and move because they've got a, a, a base established here. But the kind of cost and the kind of competition that a company like this uh, faces, a lot of times workers' comp is a difference in that, uh, that area. Why is Illinois bad in that area or whatever? We're the seventh highest in the nation. There's two areas of workers' comp that people need to remember and understand. There's the medical side, an employee is injured in the workplace, needs to go to the hospital, whatever. Uh, workers' compensation is charged in the medical world at a higher rate than it is if you happen to have an injury at your home. Example, um, if you have to have a rotator cuff uh, surgery, a surgeon in Medicare situation or a regular health care situation would charge maybe $2,500 to $3,000 for that that surgery would take place on somebody's risk. In the workers' comp area, that might be as much as $8,000 for that same procedure. And we've allowed that to occur and allowed that to grow, and therefore that drives the cost up. The other side is that if you happen to lose the use of a body part, an arm, per let's say, is, uh, is injured, the calculation for the loss of that is based on the number of weeks that uh, is calculated there and there's a value put on it. So for example, the use of my right arm if I've lost that in Illinois might be as high as $450,000. Average cost across the country, $165,000. Two and a half times that gap. Why has that occurred? And that's one of the reasons we're out and sort of astounding the clarion call. We've got to make some changes in some very important areas if we're going to keep jobs in this state. Before I go to Dennis, why has that occurred, do we know? And, and what would you say, you know, you've heard all the criticisms before. Some people would say, you know, you're, you're not concerned about the little guy who's working and hurt on the job and, and you're going to throw him out no, just to cut it's, costs. It's not true. Owners like Dennis are very concerned about their employees. If there's an injury occur, they want them, one, to get the best medical care possible and they want to get them back to work as soon as possible. Because the investment in an employee to be in part, involved in running the kind of machines that we see in a facility like this, you just don't find employees who can do that well. So you want to make sure that occurs. The idea, however, is how come that the medical community is allowed to charge that much as a higher rate and why do union leaders, not so much union members, themselves keep pushing and pushing thinking that there's an endless pot of money that business owners have to be able to pay workers comp premiums or self-insured area. Why has it occurred? Well, the political situation in this state has allowed it to occur over a time period, I think, a long time period of getting there. And that's why we think some changes and why we agree with Governor Rauner in calling for work comp changes in trying to turn around Illinois' problems. 
and Dennis, let's talk about you. You're in, in many ways representative of what we would want to have happen to businesses in Illinois. In other words, as I understand it, you're, this business started under your grandfather. He was probably like a solo worker. But bit right. by bit by bit, he added new clients. He had enough work. He had to get some help, and he hired people. Today, here you are in a really nice new facility. I mean, it's an older building that's been completely transformed. So I'm sure on one hand, you've added to the tax value of this building. How many people do you have working here with ASIN Company? Uh, we currently have 49. And we and moved here uh, four years ago, we had 21. So more than doubled in four years. Correct. Yes. Uh, you and I had talked a little bit. One of the challenges facing you, aside from workers' comp and, and these kind of issues, is just uh, the issue of skilled labor and finding good people to hire. Absolutely, absolutely. There seems to be a uh, little bit of lacking of, of schools that people can go to to learn certain trades, uh, electrical skills, sheet metal, welding, those types of things. Lincoln Land Community College has done a great job with their career center. We need more of that, or even in the high school level, perhaps some more used to be shop classes that, that I don't think are uh, quite as prevalent these days. But uh, it is difficult to find good skilled labor. Uh, a lot of folks get out of college with a $100,000 debt and no job and they may not have the skills that they need to do the types of things that, that our business and, and many, many other businesses, I, I hear the same thing. That uh, so, so we would be uh, uh, in favor of doing whatever we could to to facilitate or help uh, bring in more vocational type of uh, schools. I think uh, some of the countries like Germany have a specific, specific program to develop some of the trades and we hear that somewhat in the legislature. When you go looking to do a hire, approximately, how many people do you have to interview before you find the, the right person? I would say on an average of probably uh, 10 or 12. And to the extent that it's that difficult to find someone who has the skills uh, and is expensive and time consuming as it is to hire someone, uh, I guess that would go to the point that you, you're, you're not looking to have that person injured on the job and be unable to be productive. Well, that's true. And also another factor is uh, uh, I'm not that familiar with the, the, the laws, and, but there is a causation situation to where I believe if 51 percent of the injury is caused at work we should be responsible but that's not the way it is now. Uh, the problem is they could be hurt uh, at their swimming pool at home and claim a hurt shoulder or whatever and we all pay for it. How have your insurance rates uh Work comp insurance rates uh, changed over the years? Uh, they've gone up significantly, yeah. And we've had really good records. Uh, but if you have, for every injury you have, no matter how small it is, your rates are going to go up. And what, when you have to put that money out, we see it with the state. The state puts more and more money out for pensions, they don't have the money for other things. Right. When your costs go up for work comp, what kind of belt tightening or changes have you had to make that otherwise you might have made in the business? Well, our business is a lot like most businesses. Our budgets need to be balanced. And, and you know, it's difficult to do when, when all those rates are going up constantly. So we have to make some very tough decisions on whether we can afford to hire or whether we sub out work to other places out of state. Uh, sometimes uh, very um, easy just to to have someone else out of state do some of that work and of course uh, that means that our local people aren't aren't getting that work have there been positions that you wanted to fill but because of the costs increasing that you you haven't hired people yes well and finding people is is, is still the largest problem yes greg uh, dennis brought up the causation and that's a big issue what in, in this discussion of workers comp Explain to us why that matters. Well, Illinois has uh, really a almost zero or, or just almost 1% cause in the workplace makes the 
business owner responsible for that injury. And so a lot of soft tissue issues, as an example, lower back, neck injuries, things of that nature that may have been caused from a, a car accident, might have been caused in a old football injury of some sort like that, but gets aggravated in the workplace, the responsibility goes to that particular uh, employer. We also have the situation to where the, um, the uh, Work Comp Commission will look at things and they'll say yeah, there could be, but it hardly ever, especially if it goes on into the court system, is ever shared with any kind of responsibility. Our uh, answer to that is, is that we think that has to be looked in total. Uh, I think it'll be very difficult to pass in the legislature a total 51% cause or whatever. So we need to tighten that area, but we also need to look, as I said earlier, medical cost and the indemnity side of this. Uh, the system costs about $3 billion a year. That's an insurance premiums paid out or self-insured uh, insurers or companies that have to take uh, responsibility for. And, you know, there's a lot of people feeding off that system. The lawyers on both sides, uh, the medical professionals, whether it's orthopedic surgeons to chiropractors to physical therapy on that side. of, it. And they fight like crazy to any kind of reforms or any kind of balancing of the work comp cost from to, to other states. And that's what is just very maddening to business owners and organizations like ours that represent companies like this and saying, folks, 300,000 jobs, if you put all those people since the turn of the century in one place, you'd have Illinois' second largest city. Don't we understand what that means to our state's economy? Uh, don't we understand about those families and, and manufacturing is usually one and a half to two jobs are created for every manufacturing job is created. And we've got flat growth in this state. We really need to get this cause out there more. And we need to make sure whether you're Republican or Democrat, that you say this is an area we ought to work together and solve this problem. You had mentioned in a speech re recently at the City Club of Chicago that I think even Idaho uh, created more manufacturing right. jobs than Illinois did. I think they were 9,000, ours yeah, is 4,000. 4,000, and as I said, our last month, uh, the number came out that those actually 4,000 jobs disappeared in the manufacturing sector in the last month. And no cry of alarm, no out saying, saying, what are we going to do here, folks? I mean, Springfield is an example of this. There used to be a vibrant manufacturing sector in this town. Those have all gone away. And look at what the, the hole that that's created in some of the neighborhoods in the city of Springfield. The violence that's going on in Chicago, where is it happening? It's happening in areas where manufacturing used to be very prevalent in that area. But in Chicago, Cook County, they've got tax policies that are literally driving businesses out of that county and looking for, if they're staying in Illinois, elsewhere in the, in the region, or looking out of state. I know, Dennis, I mean, from running a business back in the 1980s, it's not just your job, but you're buying materials from any number of other suppliers to your business, right? Absolutely, we sure are. What kind of things would you be buying, and are you buying those in Illinois or from out of state? Well, we try to buy most of it in Illinois. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we're finding that more and more of them are out of state. But we buy a lot of uh, raw aluminum and steel, plastics, inks, uh, paint, uh, products that uh, uh, we, we use quite a bit of. And, and what he just said there, Terry, is the thing about Illinois manufacturing. We are across the uh, spectrum in various products. You mentioned steel, we're a big steel processing state. Plastics in the chemical industry, a big area in that regard. The whole paints and all of that kind of area are made in this state and we still are very competitive, mainly because our workforce in this state is a good and trainable workforce. But the problem is, too many of them are beginning to look like me and Dennis in the fact as we move along in the baby boom bubble are retiring. So the need for the kind of vocational education aspects and, and certification of people being able to do the, a job is even more and more needed in this state. So when we have vacancies in the manufacturing arena and can't fill them because of that, that even should drive us even more crazy because we can solve that problem. And we're finding that we need to do more and more training in-house. And that's very expensive when you bring someone in who has basically a very low skill level and we have to train them. Uh, it can take a lot of time and resources and, and, and money to do that. 
And then, of course, uh, you always run the risk of that person perhaps not sticking around, and uh, so it's a loss. And all that so, time and training it goes out the door. Right, right. So uh, we would much rather support uh, community colleges or universities that uh, recognize that and, and uh, could, could help in that regard. Greg, when we, when we look at the other states that you say, and they're growing, and they're growing in the same national economy that Illinois is in, what are they doing right that we're not doing? Well, for example, we have various tax credits that are at the moment expired. Uh, research and development tax credit. We are a state that I was talking earlier about the sectors. Pharmaceutical manufacturing as an example. Number of the jobs in the north, northern part of the state directly involved in them. The research and development of what those companies are doing are their lifeblood. They're not looking at the product that they're selling today. They're already developing the replacements for that five, six, ten years down the road. We as a state like this don't have a credit, a tax credit, those other states do for that kind of uh, activity. Just crazy that we don't have it. Manuf manufacturers purchase credit, another example. Items that are purchased that are not directly related in the process of manufacturing, you get a credit in sales tax for those kinds of things. It's a headache for companies like uh, ACE to be able to keep up with all that paperwork. We should streamline it and make it easier, and those states do that kind of thing as well. Uh, those states also have their fiscal house in order. Illinois does not. Dennis and I were talking before we went on air about they do business with the state. They have to wait for their payment from the state like other vendors lined up for that. Essentially, state government is financing its activities on the back of small businesses like Ace. That's just wrong. And our employees and, and our vendors don't wait. We pay them Correct. every week. And you so. pay your taxes on time. <laughs> the taxes are paid <laughs> on time. <laughs> that's, that's right. Yeah, it's, it's a challenge. <laughs> I was talking to a farmer, and you talk to basically anyone in business, uh, another major issue is regulations. And what people say, we, it's not a question of no regulations, we want sensible regulations, and one where the paperwork does, it, where, where you can still be doing your job and not become a, a person who's filling out forms every day. Yeah, you see these little neon signs that you see around here? They're all powered by little transformers, like fluorescent lamps have a little ballast. And uh, EPA came in here one day and said, well, these are transformers, they must have PCBs in them. Well, after uh, nine months of us hiring consultants and lawyers and going through lab tests and spending $12,000, we proved that they didn't have PCBs in them. Did the EPA give you your 12 grand back for forcing you to? They didn't even say I'm sorry. <laughs> Greg, how much of a, when we look at the state, is, is that also an issue statewide that the legislature needs to be addressing? Regulation? Absolutely it is. And uh, the sort of a notion, we joke almost, that in Illinois we make it harder for you to do business than easier to do business. And when you made the question about what are other states doing, uh, you look at their economic development departments, that they're not trying to throw up roadblocks as an example to a company to operate. They're trying to facilitate and help that. Governor Rauner's administration is attempting to do a transformation in DECO and others in trying to make it a more business friendly operation, not to throw open the door to uh, have uh, dangerous workplaces or not following federal environmental protection acts or things of that nature, but just get through the process uh, of the kind of permitting process that a company like this has to operate in. It should just be easier. And again, the reason for this, remember, 300,000 jobs gone. And um, those are jobs that are never coming back. A lot of people say, well, automation and those kind of things, robots are now doing the job. It's not true. I mean, some of those jobs would have disappeared. There's no doubt because manufacturers are doing things more efficiently, more uh, productivity out of their employees all the time. But what we have got to have with, with this whole thing is a change in the view of what's going on. And that's what I'm going to continue to harp on day in and day out when the legislature gets back. In fact, I may get Dennis to do a big sign on the side of our building in Springfield to say $300,000 or 300,000 jobs gone. What are you going to do about it to the legislature and things of that nature so that they're reminded of that every time they come to town? And I, we just came from taping an event uh, and a comment was made that relative to higher education, we have uh, other states picking off our students because of all the turmoil that's going on. Uh, do we have similarly uh, other states coming in here and knocking on the doors of manufacturers and saying, 
come to Indiana, come to Wisconsin? All the time. I, uh, in that speech you mentioned, uh, referenced in Chicago, I said, you know, I started in this business back in the late 70s. And if you'd have told me in the 78 that uh, one of these days Indiana would be putting up billboards making fun of us and getting our jobs to go to Indiana, you'd go, no way that's ever going to happen. But it happens. I was driving out of Illinois and going to a wedding and three billboards before I got out of the Chicago area saying that very thing. You're annoyed at Illinois, come to Indiana, a state that works. They are coming and all the time they're always knocking on the doors of our members and it just it's just crazy that that's happening one last question Dennis for you uh, no business stands still especially in this day and age of technology and you need to have some profits that you don't get to put in your pocket but to set aside so that you can be buying the newer thing the newer tools so that you can stay current Is that right? because as we looked around we see these old neon signs from 50 60 years ago Today's signs are constantly changing, upscale, brand new. How much of a challenge is that to run a business and stay technologically current? It's a huge challenge. That, that piece of equipment right there is $150,000. We just put it in about nine months ago. Uh, and, and just regular maintenance uh, as we speak. We got $50,000 worth of roof work being done as we speak. Uh, and, and what we're finding is that as we save money to, to try to pay for upgrades, we're taxed on that money then. So it's it's like there needs to be a system where we can have like an escrow account or something that is not taxed on those dollars uh, so that uh, it'll encourage businesses to to be able to, to save and to invest it uh, as they need it. And that's the key issue right there. A company like this, the lifeblood is what kind of money they're putting back into the business all the time. The day that a company when, uh, stops reinvesting in its facilities, you can start to set the timetable when that building or that facility is going to close. It's always a key factor. And when the companies like this invest, it's money back into the community that they're doing when they're buying the kind of materials for this roof or those kinds of things. I think it's, you know, people just have to understand the cycle and the circle that this all goes in. My grandfather used to always say, if you're not growing, you're dying. It's true. Well, and I would just uh, point out to people something they can relate to. I mean, years ago, their first mobile phone was probably a flip phone. It was a great invention at the time. The state of the art. Anyone who's just producing flip phones, flip phones today. This is the sixth generation. The seventh generation is coming, and this isn't even ten years. The technology of an iPhone is not even ten years old yet. No. No. Well, gentlemen, we wish you well, uh, Greg. But maybe before I close out, what would you say to either the viewers? What should they do? Should they contact their lawmakers? Right. What kind of things can they? If they say we get it, but. What can one person do? What can they do? Right now, the politicians, it's um, late September, knocking on doors, asking for votes. When one of them comes to your door, you ought to start asking, what are you doing about trying to stem the loss of manufacturing in this state? What are you trying to do to get the fiscal house in order? What are you doing in trying to make sure that there's skilled workforce there? Give me your answers. And don't tell me that, you know, well, we're really working on it or bills or whatever. I want to hear about it when you get back to Springfield, that you're doing those kind of things. Whether you go to Rock Island and see the, the loss of manufacturing jobs, that community, you drive in on the north side of Peoria, I've coined the phrase that Illinois is closing one day at a time because of the inaction of our governmental leaders. You need to wake up. They do. Gentlemen, we wish you well and uh, thank, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.